All right. Good evening, everyone. If I could have your attention, thank you all for joining. My name is Lauren Lind, and I'm the Planning and Zoning Director for the Town of Cohasset. Thank you tonight for joining us. Tonight is the first of a three-part series of forums that we're planning through the Zoning Bylaw Committee for to discuss zoning with the community. Tonight, we are really going to be focusing on topics. We will break down the session into two segments. We'll focus on Cohasset Harbor, and then we'll also discuss Cohasset Village. The plan tonight is to really provide the community, all of you here tonight, as well as those that are watching on Zoom. I will uh, make a note that we are live on Zoom. We're streaming live on Facebook 143 TV, and there's um, also going to be recordings of this available for anyone who's not able to participate tonight and who's not available to watch this evening. So back to what I was saying a moment ago, it's really an opportunity for a public dialogue. The intent here and the background is that the Zoning Bylaw Committee was established through the charge of the Select Board to engage the community in a comprehensive zoning rewrite process. We'll get more into the history in a little bit, but really the Town of Classic Zoning Bylaws have not been comprehensively updated in a very long time over about three decades at this point. So it's really been a patchwork quilt of adoptions and amendments over time. And it's come time to take a look at this zoning bylaw comprehensively. The committee is working with town council to do a diagnostic of updates that should be, I'm sorry, is there an alarm going off? Okay. Um, um, <laughs> so the zoning bylaw committee is working in two paths right now, working with the town council to work on updates and we'll be planning to bring forth zoning bylaw changes in an upcoming town meeting cycle that are administrative in nature, reorganizing our zoning bylaw. On the other path, there are a series of more policy related content topics that the community would like to have some more feedback in. And this is an opportunity for you to learn about tools and techniques of zoning, learn about some things that the committee has been studying and start to ask questions and give us your thoughts and some potential ideas that you may have before we're in a process where we're actually in a public hearing that goes before the planning board leading into town meeting. So we really encourage you tonight, we'll have a dedicated opportunity. We'll have some presentations followed by dedicated question and answer periods. We wanna hear from you and for anyone who wants to comment, but not necessarily tonight. We also have a zoning comment form that will be live. It's uh, launched right now through the website. There's QR codes that if you're not familiar with the QR code, these funny looking squares, you take your camera out on a smartphone, you hold it in front of this, and it will bring you up to an option to <coughs> click a link and you'll be brought to the zoning comment form. You can leave comments there. You can leave multiple entries. And again, we really are encouraging your feedback in this process. So. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce those of us that are here tonight who you'll be hearing from. Um, to my left over here, you have Justin Schreer, our communications uh, staff person and our tech guru for the night. We have uh, to my right, Thomas Callahan. He's the chair of the planning board and also the chair of the zoning bylaw committee. Christian Brandt is from our regional planning agency, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and he will be our moderator for the Q&A sessions tonight. And then finally, all the way to my right, you have Cassandra Ferry, our assistant town planner. Um, excellent addition to our department. And then I just want to recognize the rest of the Zoning Bylaw Committee, Jack Creighton, a member of the Select Board, Cassie Malatesta, a representative from the Master Plan Implementation Committee, David Farag is a resident at large, and we have Clark Brewer, a representative from the Planning Board. So again, uh, my name is Lauren Lind. If you have any questions throughout the process or about what the next process is in zoning, anything, please contact me. I'm in the planning office. You can email me at lind, L-I-N-D, at classitma.org. I'm now going to turn it over to Tom Callahan. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. thank you, Lauren. Thank you, and uh, welcome. And thank you all for coming out here tonight. Appreciate it for those of you who are listening on Zoom and television. As I said, I'm Tom Callahan, the chair of the planning board and the zoning bylaw committee. Uh, I first want to start with some thanks to the members of the bylaw committee, first and foremost, but also to Lauren and Cassandra. Uh, for the immeasurable help that they are providing with us behind the scenes to get all this, these, this thing put together and all of our work put together. Uh, Justin Schreer, our new communications director, has done a great job uh, with this. I also want to thank our town manager who's here for his support of this effort and our town council, KP Law, I don't believe they have anyone here tonight, but uh, they have come on board to help us with this, the writing process as we go through this. Um, I also, I think I should recognize that um, uh, Woody Chittick, our zoning board chair, and Katie Dugan were parts of the prior 
master plan, uh, I mean the zoning bylaw working group. I'm sorry. Um, all right, I'll yell if you might. If you might. All right. Um, I want to thank Katie. I want to thank Katie and Woody as well for their their efforts uh, in our work over the past two years. So to just give you a brief history, as Lauren said, the bylaw committee was just formed this summer by the select board, and it was a retooling of this effort uh, for the prior two years. There was what was called a zoning bylaw working group, which was an offshoot of the master plan implementation committee. And myself, I, I was on that board as well. And for the past two years, we'd mostly done a lot of research on, on, and benchmarking research of our own bylaw, other bylaws, seeing what other communities are doing, and trying to identify and spot issues that we need to focus on. Uh, we now will be getting into the process of actual writing of new bylaw texts and making changes. A lot of it will be housekeeping and reorganization because it's been the bylaw has just had a lot of things grafted onto it over the years, and it's, an, it's somewhat of an organizational mess. But we are also going to be relooking at some of the substance of the bylaw, which, as Lauren said, uh, the, the real core of the bylaw probably hasn't been touched since 1986, and it's, it's, we're way past due. Um, the, the game plan at the moment is to come forward with changes to the bylaw in two steps at next Springstown meeting and then at next Fallstown meeting. Uh, next Springstown meeting will probably largely be on reorgan reorganizing and the housekeeping of the bylaw. <laughs> Uh, the fall town meeting will be heavy on substance um, uh, when we get to those those provisions. So if I can, with the slide, Justin. Uh, you can go a couple, a couple of slides in. All right, again, this is just the background of the bylaw committee and the, uh, the working group that was before it. And, you know, over the last few years, we have put together a lot of plans in this town, a master plan, harbor plan, housing plan, open space plan. And uh, this, this slide is showing what the com community vision was as a result of the master plan. These are some of the goals and objectives of the master plan. Our effort springs from the master plan, which made recommendations that we, we do a comprehensive review of zoning. And the master's plan spoke mostly in generalities rather than specifics, but I don't know if you can read all of that up there, but you know, in, in the harbor, we're, we're trying to uh, preserve its current character where it is a mix of recreational use, access to the public, but as well as maintaining its, the, the commercial businesses that are down there and maintaining a, a, a working uh, fishing fleet. That, that's also part of the harbor plan as well. So we, we're taking that as our overall guidance. And if you go to the next slide, please. And again, this is the community vision that comes out of the harbor. And you can see what the, what the goal is. is we have tried, there are multi, multiple goals here of trying to keep the public's use of the harbor, but also having our fishing fleet and make sure that everyone has access to and, and enjoys the use of our, our harbor. Next slide. Again, my comments are going to be relatively short because we do want to uh, do want to uh, focus on the uh, Q and A and feedback from members of the community. This is the uh, current zoning in the harbor, and, and one of the issues we had flagged in the working group in this committee over the last two years is to consolidate this polyglot of zoning that we have down in the harbor. Now my pointer is not going to work on the TV screen, but I'll work here on the map. Um, in the core, in the cove, this, this blue area that goes around is what we currently call our waterfront business district and regulates the commercial uses on the harbor. On the end of Elm Street, where it comes into Summer Street, the buildings on the opposite side of the street are also commercially zoned. Everything on the land side of Elm Street is a vestige of our old downtown business district, which our village used to be. And then in the code, you'll see there's cross hatching in here. And in, it was either 2017 or 18, we created the Harbor Village Overlay District. And that overlay was spread across the hotel site and then all of the commercial properties on the land side of Elm Street. 
And the major change there was to allow for mixed use, mixed use being commercial on the first floor, residential above. Uh, previously in the waterfront business, well, existing in the waterfront business district, there is no residential use that's permitted. Yes, sir. Do they have approval already to do that? The hotel project? <coughs> yes. Yes, and they've started <laughs> they've started construction. Yes, they have. Anybody's been down there lately? Comes in against uh, people who seeing the ocean and everything else. Well, I, I will tell you about it. I don't want to get wait till the Q and A period. I don't want to get too sidetracked on specific questions. But that bylaw, in the bylaw, it required the overlay bylaw when it was passed by the community. It required a preservation of viewscapes, and so there is a viewscape when you're on Elm Street that you'll be able to see straight to the water as you're proceeding down Elm Street towards the harbor. The buildings on the hotel side of the site, there's two, and there is a view corridor between them as well. We, we can, when we get to Q&A, if there's more questions, sir, I appreciate you you're just saving them to that time, if you don't mind. Um, the other thing, what we also have in the harbor down here in the light purple at the end of Parker Ave, where there is the town Haggerty property, the town boat ramp, uh, and the float, and then the private marina across the street. That is zoned light industry. Uh, that has been there for quite some time. This green spot is the marsh behind Parker Avenue. That's zoned as open space. Parker Avenue is residential. Government Island is zoned as residential as well. Residence C, the yellow here is residence B. And then we go back up to the other side of the harbor. Uh, the Oaks Estate is a residentially zoned property. The Yacht Club on the water is residential zone, but it would be a, a uh, pre-existing use that is allowed to continue. And if we continue all the way out here to the Bellamine property, that's also residentially zoned. So on this, the committee's thoughts, and again, nothing the committee has discussed has been cast in stone yet. But what we are considering doing is all the waterfront properties, with the exception of the residential ones that are still in residential use, is consolidated into a single district. Anything that is residential here on Parker Avenue, on the land side of Border Street, Margin Street, none of the residential districts would be changed. Possible exception. The Legion is a commercial use. It's at the end of residence. It's in a residence B. It is a commercial use. And whether we bring that in so it becomes a, as a right use rather than a grandfathered use, that, that's just an issue of where we set boundaries. <coughs> but the idea is whether we call it waterfront business or we, or we call it a harbor district or something is to consolidate all of these commercial existing commercial districts into one single district. At the moment, another issue we've talked about is uses of the harbor. And at the moment, and then up on this wall over here, if you have a chance during the break, it is a list of all the uses that are allowed in the waterfront business district at the moment, as of right or as of by special permit. And we also have it for the village as well for that discussion. Within the committee over the last two years, there's been no discussion uh, about changing many of the uses there. The only real issue with use that we have discussed at this point is that the Harbor Overlay District, which again would, would, would disappear in the, in the consolidation. The question is, do we extend the use of mixed use around the other parts of the Harbor? Now, there aren't many commercial properties actually on the waterfront, but they're here, here, you know, the Atlantica site, which is already being permitted and redeveloped. There's the Lobster Pound site. There's the end of Parker Avenue sites. So we're not talking an extensive amount of properties. And then, of course, the land side of Elm Street. And that's been our major use discussion, is what should we extend more residential use in the harbor or not? And again, no decision has been made on that, and that's the purpose of tonight, is to get feedback from everyone here. Another issue we've discussed is height, the height of buildings in the harbor. Right now, everywhere in Cohasset, we have a height limit of 35 feet. Um, the definition of height is sometimes confusing. That's being proposed for change. 
but the issue here is not the definition, but the height. <laughs> and in the harbor, when you start at the bottom of the measurement of 35 feet, you have to account for what's called base flood elevation. So the, bo the bottom of the structure, the 35 feet first has to be superimposed on the flood elevation and then go up from there. When the overlay district was brought in, there was no change to the height made at the time. In consideration of future development, the question that we are debating, and again, no decision has been made, is do we lower the limit of 35 feet in the harbor and what would be this new harbor district, which would be the, the commercial waterfront properties? Um, and so th those are the issues that we've highlighted down in the, in the harbor. Um, I, you'll find in the, some of the materials that there are some issues that overlap the harbor and the village. I'll mention some of those now. The two main ones are design and parking. And I'll just say, I know parking is a concern, but lots of folks, uh, it's come up with the permits that we've been, the planning board and the zoning board have been dealing with in the harbor. And parking is not so much of a zoning issue as we see it as it is a where can we put it issue. Um, the zoning bylaw will deal with how many spaces are required by a particular use. And both the, the, the hotel project and the Atlantica project are meeting their requirements in that regard. We can tweak the size of parking spaces. We can do little tweaks to the bylaw, but the real issue of parking that we're gonna confront both in the harbor and in the village is where to put it, not how to zone for it. Uh, that, that's gonna be the major issue. We'll be glad to take any questions and comments people have about parking, but I just wanna emphasize that it's not uh, a major zoning issue as it is so much just a location issue. All right, so with that, that, that's all my brief comments is just to give you an overview of the things we've been thinking about. And I'm gonna turn it over to Christian Brandt to do uh, Q&A. And I hope you will all uh, give us some valuable feedback. Don't be shy, because um, we really would use the help. And again, you know, this has been done before with the master plan and the other plans. We've done this kind of community feedback and it's been invaluable to get where we are today. So thank you for your attention. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Brandt. I work for the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We are the regional planning agency for the greater Boston area, which includes Cohasset. Uh, and in that, uh, at that agency, I am the community engagement manager. So I was asked to be here to help facilitate the Q and A um, for today. I'm very excited to hear from all of you. I um, this is my first time in Cohasset. It's very wonderful. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I just wanted to go over a few sort of like things to talk about that will help us hear the most amount of people uh, uh, and get the most amount of questions answered today. Because I know that this is a full house. We have a fair amount of people on Zoom. So I want to make sure that everyone who has questions and wants to ask them can. Um, we are aiming to be done with the Q&A at 7.45. So right now it is 6.52. So that gives us a fair amount of time to answer questions. So I expect all of you to ask one. Um, maybe I'm biting off more than I can chew with that. But um, essentially what I am going to plan to do is alternate between the folks who are here and the folks who have joined us on Zoom. So that I'll take one question from the audience from all of you and then one question from Zoom. If there is no one who has their hand raised on Zoom, we will just proceed to the next person here. Does that sound good to everyone? Um, that way, I think we can make sure that uh, we're not forgetting about the folks on Zoom or we're not only listening to the folks on Zoom and that we everyone can get the chance to be heard. Um, when you come up, just like at any other uh, uh, meeting, we ask that you say your name and your address. Um, if you aren't a Cohasset property owner, we just ask that you indicate what your affiliation is. So, you know, if you're joining this meeting from outside of Cohasset, just let us know what the reason was that brought you here. Um, and don't worry if you forget, I will remind you. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is that we will be recording, or this is the microphone that you'll be using. I'm gonna move it to this front table. So I'm gonna ask that you s come to the front table to speak. You don't have to lean down to speak to the microphone. You can sort of be normal, um, but, because we're going to be answering questions, I will just ask that everyone keeps the, their side conversations to a minimum because otherwise this will pick up 
what you're, so first of all, it'll pick up what you're saying. <laughs> so that's something useful to know. And second of all, it just makes it a little bit harder for folks who are on Zoom to hear. And so I wanna make sure that they can hear as well. Um, we've all been in a Zoom meeting where there's lots of background noise and somebody's not unmuted. It makes it really not a pleasant experience. So, um, and then I think there's one other thing, but I'm gonna take this to the center. Um, Uh, the last thing I'll just say is that because there are so many of you, uh, which is wonderful to see, I'm going to ask that you uh, be as direct with your question as you can be. Um, and in order to facilitate that, I may uh, sort of intervene and ask you to get closer to the point. Um, it's not because I don't want to hear what you're saying. It is because I want everyone to be able to ask their question. Um, and so if you're sort of looking for what to say, I might sort of help you along the way, as it were. All right, so without further ado, uh, we can start with, uh, if anyone has, their, has a burning question to ask in the audience, please feel free to step up to the mic and then we can go from that way. If I'm not seeing anyone, I will go to Zoom. All right, any hands raised on Zoom? Yes. Okay. We have one, one person, uh, Anne Brophy, who I will promote to, to speak right now. Great. And uh, Anne is live, so you can, you, you can check. Awesome. Anne, please. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Anne Brophy, 16 Beechwood Street. I really appreciate this forum. Thank you very much. My question is uh, relative to your, your, you're presenting to us a change in the zoning. Yet I, I'm a little unclear of the significance if we shift from the current zoning to say residential, I, I, I guess what I want to articulate is my concern is that if it becomes all private residential there, the access to the harbor, you're going to have all these large homes that makes the harbor less accessible to the general public. So I guess my question would be if you could maybe more uh, clarify a little bit more the the significance of the change if it goes from the current zoning to what you're proposing. That, that's my question. Thank you, Ann, for that question. And I'll just point to the map again. Um, first of all, I, I want to make it clear, we're not proposing anything at this point. That, that comes at town meeting when we actually have bylaws to present to you. We are just looking for feedback on ideas. The idea of the consolidation of the districts is to, is again, first and foremost, a housekeeping is just that there's a polyglot of districts down there, and just that for simplicity's sake, is having everything that is commercial in the harbor area be in a single district. And again, I want to emphasize that's commercial. Nobody is proposing at all the idea of turning the waterfront properties, which are currently commercial, into solely residential properties. The existing residences down in the harbor area here, residence A, residence B, residence C, we are not proposing for any change. Perhaps the Yacht Club only in the sense of making its use as a right, as it would be in a waterfront commercial district as opposed to what it is today, which is a pre-existing uh, use, not non-conforming use. And again, the only other possibility is a commercial property uh, that is located in the residence fee district. So nobody's proposing solely residential here. So there's no fear that all of this will become houses. The issue with uses are do we extend mixed use all along the harbor. And mixed use is commercial on the first floor, residential above. That is the only <laughs> idea that is on the table because our existing overlay district, which is again in here in the Cove area, already has allowed that. The town passed that, what was it, George, 17 or 18? 2017. 2017. So that's been in existence now for five years. Uh, and again, one project is being developed under that. There are other properties that are still within that district that have not been redeveloped yet. But that, that's the sole question, Anne, is whether we allow mixed use, not solely residential. Great. Anne, does that answer your question? 
Uh, yes, yes, I get. I guess it does. Thank you. Awesome. If you wouldn't mind joining us at the front, <laughs> that way we can pick up your question for the folks on Zoom. Jim Davis, 257 Atlantic Avenue. Uh, my question is, first of all, uh, what is the mission of zoning in Cohasset and particularly this area? And what then would be the mission of any change? That's the first question. And then just responding to the previous uh, uh, questioner, accessibility. One of the things the uh, Harbor Plan, Municipal Harbor Plan, wanted to create is greater accessibility to the harbor for all of the community. And that's why we have the, the view corridor down Elm Street. That's why we have a captain's walk proposed all the way around the, the harbor. Uh, so the mission, at least, of the harbor plan is to create greater accessibility to everybody to the, to the harbor. So those are kind of one is a question. The other is kind of a comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, well, our, our zoning bylaw, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but there, in, in, in its introductory <clears throat> sections has a list of the purposes of the zoning bylaw. And we, we have a state zoning act. That is the overall umbrella that we operate under. And that sets out some very generalized terms and very specific provisions as well that we have to live with. But local zoning allows a community to uh, to tweak the state law to a certain extent, but basically to decide how it wants to be developed. It allows local communities to set districts. It allows you know, uh, local communities to set dimensional regulations, size of lots, setbacks, frontage, that kind of thing. And it also allows a local community to determine the uses of, that are going to be allowed within these different residential districts. That, that's its purpose. Um, in, in this, this respect, as Lauren might have mentioned, the purpose of doing a redo of the zoning bylaw is that, again, part of it is housekeeping just because it's become an organizational mess with everything that's been grafted onto it over the years. But in terms of the core of that bylaw, area, uses, districts, we haven't looked at that since 1986. Uh, there were major changes made in 1969, I believe, and we changed frontage substantially. And the question is now, as we are, you know, in a quarter of the way into the 21st century, is it time to relook at some of the restrictions we have as we go forward and how much the town wants to be built out in the future? That's the overall picture that we're looking at, specifically with the harbor. Again, the district issue is mostly a housekeeping and cleanup issue. Because, again, we are not proposing, well, nobody on the committee has thrown out any ideas that we change uses. For example, that we stop allowing uh, a boatyard use or a restaurant use. Nobody has suggested any of that. So it's mostly housekeeping. We, again, the, issue, the use issue that we focused on is, is residential. But, um, you know, and, and as far as the height, yes, that would be a substantial change, but it is also dealing with the reality that we do have to account for the state uh, for the base flood elevations. And the question is, do we want to limit the height, make that change so that we don't have an overly high building built on one of these few commercial properties down here on the waterfront? That's the reason we're looking at it. There isn't something you know, major that's going to change the harbor from what it is today. That's not the objective, at least at this point. But again, if you folks say, well, we shouldn't have any restaurants down there. We shouldn't have any hotels down there. You know, these are things we've had there traditionally, but that, that's what we want to hear from you <clears throat> as to what we should or should not allow to have happen as we go forward. Same with the village and the same as when we get to the, there'll be forums in the next year too, where we get to suggestions about the table of dimensions and we get into the, the, to the use table. There'll be other substantive things we're going to talk about and, and be looking at, so, you know, that, that question will be very appropriate then. But for the harbor, it is largely a housekeeping issue at this point. Great. So I think we have one person on Zoom with their hand up. We do. Peter Pescatori. Great. So Peter, whenever you're ready. Yeah. 
If you are talking, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Is he muted? He's on mute. He's on mute? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We can hear you. Peter Pescatori, 12 Lantern Lane. I just wanted to support Tim's comment about access to the harbor. The, the open space and recreation plan has one of its major tenants is just that, to provide more access to the harbor and more recreational opportunities to the harbor. So any bylaw that's uh, put forward should, uh, should have that as a, a foundational item. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. I'm sorry, Tim, that I didn't address that part of it. But, you know, Tim was good enough to mention the fact that uh, we, we have a captain's walk that is being improved and expanded. It's part of the hotel project. It's part of the Atlantica project. Uh, you, you know, absent the town actually owning property in the harbor, we can't absolutely guarantee public access at every point. But the town owns the property down, you know, on the Haggerty property down at the end of uh, Parker Ave. And it has the parking and boat ramp. We have Government Island, which is town owned property. That, again, no plans to change any of this unless the town gets into some desperate situation where it's selling property off. So, you know, if opportunities present themselves for the town to purchase more property on the harbor, great. But you know, the town would have to pay for that. But all of these projects under our current zoning that are being put forward are incorporating the captain's walk and access to the harbor. And there would be no intent to change that whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, there is a state law, Chapter 91, that these projects also have to go through that also works to ensure public access to the harbor. Yes, if you wouldn't mind coming to the front, that'd be great. I'm Jack Buckley, 272 North Main Street. I'm concerned, I'm uh, curious rather about what constitutes light industry <laughs> and um, in terms of what are some of the potential um, uses of property under the current zoning. And that's really just curiosity. Yeah. My, Real question is how would Parker Ave be rezoned such that 40 Parker Ave, which is now occupied by CSCR, how would um, that be rezoned in the spirit of public access? Okay, so um, again, um, we don't have our bylaw. We don't have our bylaw handy to tell you what the uses are in light industry. I think the only other light industry district we have might be up on 3A. But I'm going to hazard a guess, and maybe Woody Chittick is here can correct me, that the light industry is a vestige of the fact that the Haggerty operating company was manufacturing furniture. And so it was a manufacturing operation right in the harbor. Um, what, as I said earlier, the idea then would be to eliminate the light industry district so there would be no risk of future manufacturing going on down there and bring that into whether we call it waterfront business or call it harbor. And it would be the uses that are allowed in that district would continue at the Haggerty property. And the uses are listed over there and uh, the Haggerty, the current use that the town owned is uh, a, a club or membership club like the yacht club, but a public space like that, that use would be continued to be allowed either as a right or by special permit as it is today. So we wouldn't see any change. It. It's really just changing the name of the district that it's in to, to say goodbye to the history that was there once before. So I, I don't see any change in that. If the town ever sold that property, you know, I. Again, I, you can't never say never, but the, the town would then have to make sure as part of any sale that it preserved the access. The boat ramp isn't going anywhere. The parking lot isn't going anywhere and, the, and the, the boat dock isn't going anywhere. So if the town ever found itself in a position where it had to sell the building, it would have to also, in, in condition of that sale, make sure that the public access to those other facilities is still allowed. I see we have two questions. We do have one person with their hand raised on Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go to them first. Yeah. Um, Mike Dick, you have the floor. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes, yes you can. Great. Um, just to follow up on Jack Buckley's question <clears throat> on the future for the end of Parker Avenue, I noticed that the light industry area shown in purple uh, also includes the marina. Mm -hmm. And I would be um, concerned that if the marina were zoned for um, harbor waterfront use um, and allow for mixed use on first floor commercial, second floor residential, that you'd be walling off the potential exists for walling off the harbor um, through a, a building or a structure that would be allowed under these new zoning rules. So I would hope that in your future discussions, as you look at um, harbor or waterfront uses, that you keep in mind that we all have a view um, to the water along many of these areas along the waterfront. And uh, it would really be a loss to the town if we created a wall to take it to its extreme, we look at the seaport district in Boston, <clears throat> which once was open to the harbor and now lies behind a wall of, of large buildings. Um, one other thing I just want to comment on is that while this presentation is very useful and very helpful, um, zoning opens up a Pandora's box of unintended consequences. And I wonder how we can protect ourselves from unintended consequences. By de definition, they're unforeseen. But I would hope that the uh, Zoning Bylaw Review Committee really works very hard to try and identify difficulties that might arise from their decisions. So that's, uh, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, well, the, the marina would be an allowed use as Marina Zora, an allowed use in the waterfront business district today. Uh, the concern about the housing is exactly why we bring up the issues of both height and whether we do extend res mixed use zoning throughout the district. Uh, I think you bring up some of the really good points as to why we might not want to do uh, an extension of mixed use and why we might want to limit the height over base flood elevation to something other than 35 feet. So you know, we, we certainly are considering that. Again, nothing has been cast in stone. These are just issues that we've um, Regarding the, you know, the comment about unintended consequences, uh, that, that's a favorite every time zoning is discussed in this town. Nobody is going to write the perfect Bible. Uh, I can assure you that you'll never have a perfect, perfect Bible. We have a lot of smart people on the committee, a lot of people with experience. We are uh, working on wards in this town and we've lived in this town. We, have, we can call on other people uh, who, who were formerly on, on this committee to, to provide their expertise and their experience. And we're certainly conscious of what we're doing and trying to act in the best interest of the town as a whole. Ultimately, the decision is not going to be this bylaw committee's. It's going to be the town's when we come to town meeting. Just want to make sure you all have the final say on this, but obviously we want to present to you something that we think will have your support and that, that you'll want to see happen. So that's why we are asking for your feedback through this kind of process. All right, so we're going to go to you and then we'll do uh, the person who has their hand raised and then we'll come to you. <laughs> Francis Collins, 404 South Main Street. I think um, the elephant in the room here that everybody sort of has ignored is the boat yard. And what is going to happen to that? I've heard a number of different plans and different schemes and nothing. It's all kind of nebulous, but I wonder if you folks in the planning board have had any re discussion with anybody as to what might happen. And that'd be a shame to see that nice piece of commercial uh, marine use uh, languish as it's been languishing now for the last several years. So anything if you know well, that you can enlighten us on, Tom, appreciate well, one it. Of, one of the rules about, uh, about this discussion tonight, particularly for the village, since we do have an active application in the village, is that we're really not at liberty to discuss an act, any kind of active application. There has been no application submitted for the Lobster Pound Boatyard site yet. We are hearing rumors like you hear. 
but I think it would be inappropriate to comment on what might happen since we don't know if it's going to be proposed there. But obviously, like every play, you know, like with the Atlantica project that has been recently permitted by the planning board and the zoning board, and the hotel site, which was permitted, we have to deal with what our current bylaw says. You know, whether, you know, whether we people want to say we should have let mixed use in the harbor is, is immaterial because the town passed it and we had to approve the project under the terms of that bylaw. Likewise, the likelihood is that the proposal for anything at the Lobster Pound and Boatyard site is going to come to us before we make any changes. And they're going to, there's, the list is over there somewhere, somewhere of what uses they're allowed to have. Boat yards and allowed use. Um, there are a whole number of other uses, but we can't dictate to the property owner, the private property owner, what he can do and which one of these uses he picks or doesn't. Unfortunately, so. If you, I, if you have a question to, I think the, the yes, I think the best thing would be to maybe do wait in the Q and A since we have other people who've had their hands raised. I didn't want to clarify the words. It's a clarification about his answer. <clears throat> sure. I want to make sure I understand you. The hotel, I mean, the waterfront property there. Yep. They have approval. They have approval. It's, it's a done deal, right? They have all their local and your state, the chapter 91 approvals as well. Yes. They have all the approvals that they need, and that's why you've seen. The buildings be demolished and site work is beginning as we speak. There's no way that would be stopped. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, all right, so we have one person with their hand raised on Zoom and then to you, sir, in the back. Elizabeth, you have Elizabeth, you have the floor. I'm sorry, this is a bait and switch. Uh, this is her husband, uh, Mark Dunn. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. Uh, you know, thank you. Uh, before, Mr. Dean, before you continue, can you just let us know what your um, address and... Uh, yeah, uh, 21 Beach Street. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for all your efforts. Uh, you know, my question is, <clears throat> if uh, the current plan, <clears throat> excuse me, was it enacted um, and it was it developed to full intensity, um, how would that compare? How much square footage could possibly be added in building footprint or building area compared to what is there now? And then ultimately, what would be the composition of those uses? Okay. Well, I uh, Area, the lot area requirements, the frontage requirements, the setbacks, the lot coverage requirements that currently exist in the waterfront business district, we have not discussed changing any of them at all. Um, in that district, the lot coverage is pretty high, I think it's 70 or 80 percent. Thank you. It has relatively small frontage, uh, it has setbacks. So probably fairly typical for the whole town, or at least the commercial area in town. Well, look, all of our commercial districts, even our 3A, have high lot coverage uh, allowances. So there's been no proposal to change any of that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the uses are listed over here on the wall in, in our bylaw. And again, there's no proposal at the moment for anyone to change any of the allowed uses. So it's hard to predict what would, what would be changed. But you know, again, we don't have a, awful lot of properties on the waterfront itself. The Atlantica site and the Salt House site is really not changing mm -hmm. in size, certainly not in height. And there's some practical reasons why that probably didn't happen because of the big flood elevation of that site would have to be built fairly high in the air. The, the hotel project is what it is. And it, it's done completely within the guidelines of the bylaw. Uh, but again, we're not proposing any of those changes in the kind of thing that will affect a lot. Uh, the okay. only 
dimensionally change if we look at it was again is the height. Do we allow 35 feet in height given the fact that we have to account for this part of the vision? Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right, to you, sir, in the back, and then we'll come to you if there's no one. Hansi? Thank you again, Tim Davis, 257 Atlantic Avenue. A couple of comments. First of all, uh, on the captain's walk. Uh, I've talked about the captain's walk and the, the plan to bring access to the harbor for the community. And Jackie Dormister, I don't know if she's here, but she is a great proponent of that. Uh, and we've all been working together to make sure that happens. And one of the things I do want to say is that all of the property owners around the harbor have been tremendously cooperative in building in the captain's walk into their plans. So I'm very pleased to, to have that happen. The next question is, uh, and Jack Buckley kind of alluded to some of this, but what really is industrial? And I'll give you an example, and I'd like you to consider this in any zoning that goes on. One of the things the Harbor Plan has encouraged is aquaculture. We are, uh, we've been, we as a community have been designing the renovation of Government Island Piers to, uh, to provide infrastructure for aquaculture of the future, whatever that may be. One of the things that may happen is if it, the aquaculture includes shellfish, then we may want to find some kind of facility, whether it's through CSCR or some other organization to grow seeds for shellfish. Does that comply with any zoning issue? But it's one thing, that's a rhetorical question. I'd like you to just consider that marine related or the terminology of chapter 91, water dependent, would that uh, growing Aquaculture starting seeds, whether it's kelp or shellfish or whatever else it is, eelgrass, would that be admitted to uh, for any uh, uh, zoning requirements? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I, I do want to mention quickly, um, you know, about the public access. One of the things to know about the hotel project is the buildings are going to be shifted closer to the sidewalk than the, the hotel was. But the trade-off for the benefit of the public for that is that we are not only getting the captain's walk, we will continue to have access to the public parking lot that's next to the Veterans Memorial. That remains a public parking. And there will also be a small park adjacent to the, well, relatively small, maybe we can argue, I think it's 20,000 square feet, is that huge? Yeah, okay. uh, we, there will be a public park adjacent to the captain's walk and adjacent to that town parking lot uh, you know, for, for sitting and enjoying the harbor. And that, that was you know, some of the trade-offs in the project, but that's also what the overlay bylaw had required to be done, that there be public amenities. And, and we certainly can take those aspects of the overlay district bylaw and incorporate those into what would be the zoning for this new harbor district. Um, regarding agriculture, I was quickly looking at the list uh, of our allowed as of right uses and our special permit uses in the harbor, and aquaculture is not mentioned specifically. There's a variety of marine uses that are. Uh, you can do agriculture, horticultural, or floriculture, meaning you can have a flower store down there, non-commercial forestry, growing of crops, and conservation of water plants, but we do not mention aquaculture specifically. So that could be a suggestion of if we do make any changes in the uses that we maybe add aquaculture. Uh, but I'll say as a sideline, I know there's a bylaw out there, uh, the navigation of the harbor, that is not a zoning issue. What goes on in the water is not a zoning issue. So it has, what we're doing with the zoning bylaw has nothing to do with that the navigation bylaw that's being proposed, but certainly we could allow as a use an aquaculture related business on the land. Uh, so thank you for that too. Do we have any questions on Zoom? No, great. So to you now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Agnes McCann, 104 Dome Street. Um, I might have missed it, but as I refer to this map, I keep wondering what do those dark lines represent? I think the red is the inset that you've been throwing up on the screen. But what are those dark blue jaggedy lines? Yeah, that. That's the town boundaries between this and Sitka. Okay, and this one? This, I'm going to guess, this blue line going around here. It's the water resource district. The water resource district. Oh, thanks. Because, because we have, because of what Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Great. Do you have any questions on Zoom? Okay, so we uh, have the chance to, this is our first sort of lull of questions. So I'm wondering if anybody has something that they would not necessarily have considered asking originally, but they've been thinking about what all the other questions and answers have been. And maybe it's not a burning question, but you still have to ask it. Yes. Mark Brewer, and I'm on the zoning bylaw committee. Um, I've been on the planning board for 15 years, was chairman of the master plan, vice chairman of the 2004 master plan, and was very involved with the Cove um, overlay district, the, uh, um, the harbor business village overlay district. And at the time, we hired a consultant, and, and right, out of the, right out of the blocks, they wanted to change the waterfront district to allow mixed use. We knew that mixed use was a goal for the Harbor Hotel site. Um, but uh, the, the thinking at the time, and it's, it's four or five years ago, was that we really wanted to see how one major project went before we changed um, um, the entire waterfront district. Um, and I think some of the thinking that Tom has been discussing is, is sort of transitional between where we were four or five years ago and uh, where we'll be in the future. And really, all of the, the goals of zoning, have there, a lot of them are aspirational. Where do we see the future of Cohasset? Where do we see the future of the harbor? It's, it's inspirational and aspirational um, for... Again, for the for the Harbor Village, it was what's the kind of smallest area we can we can change by zoning and see how it goes before we change the whole harbor. There may not be any comments. Tom may have some comments on this, or um, but that was the thinking at the time. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, no questions. I see you with your hand raised. Yes. Bob, Bob Deutsch, 70 Aaron River Road in Cohasset. My question is a simple one, a very direct one. What is the cost to the taxpayers uh, and to the community of the ch uh, proposed changes to the harbor area? For ex and just as an example, increase perhaps in police and fire, um, et cetera. And to what degree is that going to be shared between the businesses and the residents? Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good one, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> um, that, that, well, the, the, generally speaking in zone, and I learned this at a, a statewide association of boards of selectmen years ago that residential zoning, for the most part, does not pay for itself with its taxes unless you have very large properties that generate a lot of taxes. And that's because residences generate children go to school. And that's where our biggest cost is. I think that Chris is here. The town budget is what, 67 70% education. So. And it's been that way for a long time. So commercial properties, as just a general rule, because they do not generate children, do not generate as many costs to the town. But yes, then the other third of the town, police, fire, general government, is covered by taxes. So, um, you know, the kind of, you know, certainly the commercial development, this is one of the reasons we want to preserve vital 
vibrant commercial areas on both on 3A, the village, and the harbor. I believe our overall commercial tax base is, it used to be when I was in Sutler, 70%. I think it's still in that neighborhood. So it's a, we have a very small commercial tax base, but the commercial tax base brings tax benefits, it brings money in without a lot of cost, as many, as many costs going out, so just as a general. The kind of residences that we're probably going to see at the hotel site, and if, if, and I again say if, the excuse was extended, it's probably not the kind of residential properties that are going to generate a lot of school children, but that's pure speculation. So, you know, residential has its costs, commercial has its costs. In, in, in the end of the day. Um, your other part was about making developers pay for things. So we've started to talk about this topic quite a bit. Um, and it falls under the category of linkage or mitigation or an impact fee. Uh, and right now, that's that's a characteristic of Boston zoning. Boston has its own zoning code. They, they play by completely different rules than the rest of the state. It's not as common in suburban communities. Uh, but we have asked our town council, we've gotten a quick answer that yes, we could put in a bylaw that required some form of mitigation or impact fee. But it's tricky because number one, A, it has, a, it has to be closely related to the project itself. So we couldn't ask the developer on the harbor to go make an improvement up at the dump or at a school, you know, build a playground somewhere. It has to be related to the project. And then when you're asking for something in, in, a, in dollars and cents, it's what is the dollars and cents you ask for? We, we struggle with that with our inclusionary zone in bylaw, which is uh, the requirement that so many affordable under the state definition of housing is built. Um, and, you know, my personal philosophy is not to take it. You check because it's hard to measure what that check should be. I mean, either the inclusionary zoning should be done on site or it should be provided somewhere else in the town. Uh, and it would be the same with a mitigation or an impact fee. What is the dollar figure we ask for if we want somebody to build a sidewalk or, or other forms of infrastructure? Now, in most cases, what happens, it's a matter of negotiation between town and developer. But you can only take those negotiations so far. You can't deny a permit to somebody because they're not giving you some benefit off-site. So we're, we're looking at this, and it's kind of tricky. And, you know, again, a hotel site, they're doing the sidewalks around their site, which are public sidewalks. They're doing uh, crosswalks. They're going to be redoing the crosswalks when all, when all construction and the trucks are done. Um, there may be improvements you're doing to the little town parking lot, 17 spaces, I'm not sure. But those are things that they volunteered to do, they negotiated, you know, they negotiated to do, but larger changes are very hard to negotiate because we have no hammer to hold on them that you must do this. So we are looking into it and particularly, you know, when we get to the village, you know, we're starting to see development under the village bylaw now more so than it's existed for 17 years and we need to start thinking about some of these things but it has to be very very narrowly tailored to what it is we can do so uh, mm -hmm. town council says it's not out of the realm of possibility but it's very difficult to write as a bylaw and we are at least thinking about it. So, thanks thanks Bob. great yes you have a question or well actually let me just make sure yes we have one person. And it's Anne. I might actually ask the member who's here because Anne's already asked a question, and then Anne, I will go to you afterwards. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Darlene Jacob, 72 Elm Street. And just a question regarding the look of anything that's coming in. Is there is a is there a plan as to how we want the town, the harbor area to look? with houses that are being redone or new businesses that may be going in that are approved. Is there right. something, because there's been a lot of problems with other things that have been built. Oh, yes. Um, I regularly read 143 on Facebook and see all the comments about that. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. That's an issue that overlaps both the village and the harbor, so I'll deal with it now. In 2018, the planning board did 
pass some design guidelines. A long time ago, we used to have a design review committee. It was an actual committee of the people that went through. I don't think it had any substantive teeth to say any or nay, but it was a process. But. So design review guidelines were put in for the harbor and the village. Not for 3A. I've read all the comments about new buildings on 3A. Um, but, and, you know, and that's a thought. We could expand it to all the commercial properties in town, and maybe that's something we should. The issue with that, with the design guidelines, is right now they're guidelines. And they generally are commanding that people come up with a colonial right. feel of buildings that is consistent with the town's look. We recently had it, but it also has a provision, I'll have to mention this because it's something funny about innovation, being innovative. <laughs> And innovation sometimes can be taken in a different direction. And then, so we, we're now we're rethinking the, the context of being innovative and modern because you know one of the other things we're going to discuss at our forum in December when we talk about environmental issues that Clark will speak on is about low impact development and sustainable development. And so that's where I think innovative has to meet design as well. Um, and so we are thinking about it, but right now the thought is. Probably not putting design requirements into the Bible because it's very hard to dictate taste. It's very hard to make a decision solely based on aesthetics. As a matter of fact, I've been to numerous state board meetings where they say, don't do that, don't do that. Again. It's just to make a decision based on aesthetics. But right now, they're guidelines. The thought maybe a little more teeth, we make them into regulations that have a little more teeth, but it's not quite a bylaw. They, Regulations can be amended a lot easier, so we can adapt with the times on, on design issues and construction issues. But we do have them in existence for the harbor and for the uh, village at the moment. And all of the applications we've had recently have been following. They, they've been taken to heart and reading them in quite detail, but they, they're giving a feel of overall colonial-ish or seaside-ish Town. You know, Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Center, I'll give you an example. It's the same architect who did the Salem Club. So it's going to look a lot like the Salem Club. Uh, the hotel project is, is very tastefully designed in a, in a colonial townhouse kind of feel, so it, it, it's, it's fine. So, um, but again, that's feedback. And do you want us to see us try to strengthen that a little bit? Or do we go with just our, you know, our guidelines and sort of try to push people in directions? Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so we'll turn to Ann, who is. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Ann Brophy, 16 Beechwood Street. So uh, the question about the taxes uh, had this vision uh, come into my mind about density. So my question is uh, relative to the harbor project that's happening now, uh, you know, where the hotel was. That, my understanding is, uh, going to be a mixed use where it will be commercial on the first floor and residential on the you know upper level. So how many units, how many residential units? Because if you make, if it's a lot, then you, and you make a lot of these areas mixed use, you could have a, quite a dense population in that small space. Uh, so I was just wondering for curiosity, how many residential units there are in that plan for that new hotel uh, because those aren't going to be, it's not going to be a hotel anymore. I think it's going to be apartments. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Ann. So there's, there's three buildings at that site, two on the harbor side, one on the hand side, where that corner building, which by the way, I don't know if anybody knew that other building on Home Street, across the street had five apartment units, kind of came from the back of that building. Um, we need the numbers 23 units. It was originally proposed for more than that, but in both the overlay district zoning and in our village zoning, we have restrictions on what's called floor area ratio. That's a measure of, of how many units you can get into a certain area depending on the lot size. And it's, it's a proportional type of zoning. It's something we, you know, when we get to the overall density of the town and talk about residential development, you know. Floor area ratio will come into our discussions, and that'll be sometime next year that we're discussing all of that. But already here and down in the overlay district, we have this floor area ratio limit that dictates size 
based on lot size. In the village, we have minimum and maximum apartment sizes because that was designed to keep you know, less expensive and more, more for, affordable uh, types of units. Um, does the, har the harbor really change? I think there's a range in the harbor. Yeah, there is a range in the harbor. It's, it's a larger unit that can be built. It is being built at the hotel site. But we, we have these limits so that we do you know, have some control over the, the density of the building. We, those would all carry through. Uh, if, certainly, if we expanded residential use here, we would carry that through. No proposal to change any of those limits in the village is being made because we want to keep the village the way we had previously designed. So. <laughs> Great, so we have one person who had her hand raised here, and we have two hands on Zoom. And just a quick time check, it is uh, 7.39. So I'm going to try, and I know that you just raised your hand as well, so I'm going to try to get to all four of us. Mine's pretty quick. It's just Great. a couple of comments. One is, um, uh, not to insult anybody, and but- And also, I'm sorry, I, could you just let us know oh, your sorry. name and address? Mary Hines, 30 Clay Spring Road. And I look around the audience, and a lot of us are in my age range, not to be insulting to anybody. <laughs> and this- this really affects the future generations. So I'm hoping the committee would think about approaching the social studies department at the high school to see if you know some teacher could do a project for them to start looking at this and the implications and orient them to the town a little bit. So I just think that might be useful. The second comment is that um, I'm on the affordable housing committee and we are looking at um, that check that you know, a uh, developer's gonna have to give um, instead of building housing on site. And um, so we're working on that over the next few months and hopefully gonna get a resol resolution of that. Thanks. I, I just wanna mention with the affordable housing at the hotel site, just so everybody knows how it was handled, uh, it was not required that it be on site. And there are a lot of reasons why not to do it in that type of project. But that developer has bought affordability rights to four units elsewhere in town that already existed. Uh, the requirement of affordable units at the project was three. We we're actually getting four without changing the denominator out of whack for the, you know, if, if anybody knows about 40B, the affordable housing law, we have to have 10% of our housing stock as affordable by state definition. So, you know, what we got with the Harbor project rather than have some arbitrarily written check and then what does the town do with the check and where is the town going to build or buy housing, the developer is provided it off-site for us. And we look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. So how we look at that at the harbor, how we look at it in the village, how we might look at it in 3A is com you know, completely different analyses based on, on you know, what is the right area for that type of housing. So we'll turn to the first participant on Zoom. Yes. Yep. Mike. Just a comment on how the meeting's being run. It's very Mike, hard. You, Mike, can you um, tell us your name and address, please? I'm sorry. Mike Dick, 27 Parker Ave. It's hard to hear Tom Callahan here at home. Um, I noticed when he was speaking there from the middle of the table, the microphone was picking him up, picking up his voice a whole lot better. So just keep that in mind, folks, so that we can follow along here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Yeah, I, um, Susan, Susan Bryant, 251 Forest Avenue. Just a quick question. The viewscapes, which I love the idea of a viewscape, is that actually a zoning thing or is that just something that we advocate for within any proposal? We wrote it into the zoning yeah. for the Harbor Project. Oh. Yeah, in the overlay, in the overlay bylaw, it's written in. Yeah. And again, that's, you know, even if we eliminate that district as no longer necessary, we, we would take pieces of it that are good, like that, and incorporate it throughout that district. So even if it's a commercial only building, we can build in requirements of viewscapes. But it is a matter of zoning that we address. We call it a view corridor. A view corridor. Yeah. And I also just, I think it's really essential for um, people who drive the elders around town, who are very proud to live in this town with all of its beauty, that there's a place you can pull over and look at the harbor if you're in a car with somebody who can't get out of the car. So that's on behalf of dad. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, so I think we have about uh, two minutes left, which is just enough time for our last 
question um, to come from Philip on Zoom. <coughs> Uh, Philip Cantillon, 97 Border Street. Uh, as you're thinking about the zoning uh, changes, bylaw changes, how does uh, public safety factor into that, such as transportation, on, uh, traffic patterns on Border Street, et cetera? Thank you. I couldn't. Hear. Could you, uh, Phil, could you repeat the last part about traffic? You cut out a little bit. Yeah, my, my question was as you're contemplating these changes to the zoning uh, bylaws, how do you factor in changes to traffic patterns in the area and potential public safety impacts? Uh, as you know, that the even pedestrian traffic, kids on bikes changes in the summer months around Border Street as opposed to the other times of the year. I'm just curious how those factors come into the zoning uh, thought process. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, the, in most of the commercial permits, certainly what one is called site plan review, the other would be a special permit. There is usually a requirement for a traffic study for what a commercial property is going to generate or a mixed use property for that matter. Um, the Atlantica project has to do that as one of the conditions of its permit and since it is not built yet with its current use. It is something that is going to be, is going to be data submitted after it's in use for some time uh, so that we can make appropriate evaluations of that. I mean, traffic volumes and things is not a zoning matter per se, but we, as part of these two particular permits, we do study the impact of traffic and, and can order as part of the permit conditions any type of mitigation measures that we think are appropriate. And, and we usually have the applicant has to submit a very properly engineered traffic study and the town will retain a traffic expert to look at the uh, data and then make some recommendations for us as part of our permit decisions. Thank you. All right, folks. So it is uh, 745, which means we've reached to the end of this part of the meeting today. So we're gonna take a 15 minute uh, intermission. Um, so there's more food over there uh, and we'll come back at eight o'clock. Um, oh yes, and for the folks on Zoom we'll also mute uh, so that you won't get all the cacophony of everybody small talking to each other. Um, and I think this is also a great time to just remind folks that if you have feedback but you don't really want to ask it in front of everyone, you can also submit it using the um, laptops over there or using the QR codes that are on the top of these tables. Great. Or email. Or email, yes. You can email Lauren or myself through the town.
We have about three minutes. Three minutes, we will start back up. Thank you. Tell me. Yep. All right. Thank you for all of you who are staying. I'll try to speak a little louder. Uh, we, we've been mostly focusing on this microphone for the uh, Zoom folks. Uh, the microphone that was provided to us for this room doesn't work. So I apologize. I'll try to speak up. But if you can't hear me, just raise your hand and let me know. So next, we want to talk about focus on the village, which for the zoning is right here, this purple area in the heart of town. In 2007, as a result of the first master plan or the earlier master plan, we did have a master plan that Clark and I were amongst the people that worked on that was finished in 2004, but was never officially adopted by the planning board at the time. Uh, but a lot of efforts went in to make some zoning changes out of that by a citizens group that Clark and I were amongst the ringleaders and rabble rousers at the time. And one of those changes that came out of that master plan 
was to change the zoning in the village. And the main, the main change there was to make it into allowing mixed use throughout the village. Um, if you think back to colonial times, the way colonial villages developed, that is the historic use of the village, shops and residences all attached in one building. But at the time, in the mid-2000s, there was some vacancies going on down there, and the, the main driving force of it was to create some economic viability for the property owners. Um, there's sometimes on 143 Facebook page, you'll see a lot of comments about the physical appearance of the village. And we certainly didn't want the village to fall completely apart and not be taken care of. So part of allowing mixed use and the ability to have rental properties or rental apartments was to provide a certain amount of economic uh, viability for all those properties. Additionally, the town, in, in addition to always being conscious of complying with 40B, we've also had had a phrase that we've used called Hassett Affordable, which was is you know heal more at our next forum when we discuss housing. But it was it's the idea of having some starter home and design uh, uh, downsizing opportunities for our young people who grew up here, and then for certainly our senior citizens to stay in town but live in smaller quarters. So that was the motivation behind it. And we, we have not seen a lot of development as a result. I think the Red Lion was done before the zoning change, the expansion, if anybody remembers. The Red Lion Barn was probably designed, well, built after that zoning change. And then there's condos at the end of James Lane on the other side of the tracks, on the hillside. And that is all residential because the bylaw allowed for the fact that development on that side of the tracks could be all residential. And that, that was a specific request of the neighborhoods in the hillside neighborhood at the time, who said they didn't want to see all commercial development on that side of the tracks that abutted up to their residences. So that, that's why the villages looks, that's why those condos are there and that's where it looks. But in recent years now, we are getting increasingly more development. Uh, there has been a permit on the, um, J, uh, the ice cream parlor site. There's been uh, one Pleasant Street, which is a long blue building that stretches to the back along the tracks. That is in the process of being redeveloped. We have a pending application uh, in the village, and uh, who knows what, you know, that we, we may see more. Wow. Oh, look at this. Prepare to the rescue. <laughs> right back. Can anybody? Oh, all right. I, I hope that's better. But um, so I, I will tell you that in the last two years of the work of the bylaw working group and now this committee, honestly, we haven't focused on the village a lot. We think that the bylaw that exists today is achieving objectives that we want. And I mentioned before that there is a size range of apartments that are allowed. The upper end of that, it's between 750 square feet and 1,500 square feet. So they are smaller units designed, again, for affordability, whether it's the state definition or, our, or just a generic definition of affordability. Uh, we do have a floor area ratio limit that limits the size of the project with respect to its lot size. It accounts for its lot size. And this was the first time we brought floor area ratio as a measuring concept in, into the town. And um, again, we, we've, we're only starting to see uses, uh, but what we're getting is what it was designed to do. Projects that are proposing uh, commercial on the first floor and residential above. I'll use one pleasant street as permitted, so we can talk about that one. Uh, you, if you know the building, it's blue, it runs along the tracks, it's very small frontage on the street, and it's a long skinny building that goes to the back. And it's all office uses primarily. It's a one-story building with a pitched roof. Well, now it's going to be those same office uses on the first floor, and it's going to have apartments on the upper two floors. And, and that developer, by the way, uh, proposed more affordable units under the state's definition than he was required to do. So we got a benefit. He's doing them on site. I 
think there were 13 units, Clark, 11, 12, 13, in that range of, of units that are being built, all fairly on the small size. So they're all going to be some something we, you know, in the we can't control market conditions, but will be affordable. And four of them will count towards the state affordability requirement that we have. Um, so we, we haven't talked, again, like I said, we haven't talked about a lot of changes to any of the dimensional requirements down there because we think what we, what was designed in 2007 uh, is appropriate and works. Um, however, we can switch to the next slide. Yes. So again, this is where design comes up again. And again, we have village design guidelines. Again, they are guidelines. We're thinking about making them regulations to maybe give them a little more teeth. Uh, they also are consistent with getting a colonial type of design. Um, and that's in, in the Pleasant Street building and the project that was for the ice cream shop site that hasn't been built. They're all coming forward. People are coming forward with those kinds of designs that are consistent with, with the look of the village. Um, Building height, again, we have 35 foot height throughout the town. And so, you know, when we look at buildings in the village, a lot of them are just one story or two stories. The red line in is the biggest one down there, and that is reaching the 35 foot limit. Um, the Pleasant Street one is under 35 feet, but it has an added floor than it well, you know, the previous building had. Um, again, there's been no giant outcry of whether we need to address the issue of height in the village. Uh, and and with, with, by the way, with respect to our 35 feet, that's the general range you see in a suburban community between 30 and 35. And yes, 35 is on the high end, but we're not outliers on that. There are other towns that have 35 foot limit. Um, the, the other, the Top bullet is a new topic that has come up to our attention, has been brought to our attention to think about, which is called buffer zoning. And the, in the village, you know, obviously the village is, is bordering residential properties all around. And it's all very close quarters. It's a residence B up here on this side, residence A on this side. And we all know that the village goes right up to houses and there's, there's there's no buffer in between them. It's a little less of an issue in the harbor. So the concept here to think about, and again, no decisions have been made, it's a relatively new idea brought to our attention, is that the setbacks and the building height that is presently allowed would be increased in these areas along the border where it borders a residential area. That I'm just throwing out numbers because I don't have the numbers in front of me right now. But if, for example, if the setback was 15 feet, you might think of doing 20 feet or 25 feet. If the building height is 35 feet, you might think of doing 28 feet, 25 feet, something like that for a certain distance. So there's sort of a stepped up effect that, that the commercial building isn't coming as close to the property line as our current zoning would allow. And that with respect to the height, there would be some sense of stepping back the height so it's not a looming 35 foot building right on the property lot. No decisions have been made in that. We're looking for feedback on that kind of idea. Could that be brought to um, other districts? Well, on 3A, there's already a buffer between the 3A commercial and the residential properties behind it. There is already that built into the 3A zone. The harbor, it is. You know, most of the residential properties are across the street rather than next to uh, the residential properties. So it might not be the same kind of need in the in the harbor, but it is an idea for the village. So um, that's really all the, the issues we've been hitting there, because, again, we, the, the 2007 bylaw has pretty much worked. It's, it's just recently seeing a spate of development. It kind of sat dormant for a long time, but it, the objectives of increasing mixed use, increasing economic viability, and creating some smaller, affordable, downsizing type units is what the current bylaw does, and we don't see a need to change those objectives. So a lot has been said, though, recently on 143 about the village. Uh, I want to caution everybody that we cannot discuss the merits of the pending project. It's pending before the planning board that I'm chair of, so I can't discuss it maybe in generalities, but really can't get into the specifics. But 
if it is, you're free to bring up if it's giving you an example of something you think needs to be done, needs to be changed, fine, but we can't really comment on the merits. I'm not going to let ourselves get caught into that. So with that, I will turn it back to uh, Christian to take over for Q&A. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll we'll move it to the table so that, that way you don't have to yeah. get up. Okay. Do you want to do that? <laughs> no, leave it where it is. Leave it where it is. Leave it where it is. And we'll move this one out to the table. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> the same thing if you want to speak so that the Zoom folks can hear you come up and close to the table. I'm not official. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, for Thank you for the microphone. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. So, uh, again, for those of you who are new, you might have joined us. My name is Christian Grant. I work for the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. That's the Greater Boston's Greater. It is Greater Boston's regional planning agency. Um, and at MAPC, I am the Community Engagement Manager, uh, and I'm here to help facilitate the Q&A for uh, today's meeting and also the two subsequent ones. So um, I'm going to do a really quick review of some of the things that I mentioned before we started the last Q&A, and because I think most of us are, have, are staying over from the first meeting, but in case you are new, um, I'm going to be alternating between folks who are here and folks who are, have raised their hand on Zoom, so that that way we can uh, make sure that we're not forgetting about our friends who've joined us virtually. Um, as you're asking your question, I'll just ask that you keep it um, succinct, and I might interrupt and uh, help you keep it succinct um, so that we can get to all the questions that we have. Um, luckily, during the first part, we had it right on time at 7.45, so that is my goal um, to help us do that again this time. Um, you all made it really easy with the questions that you were asking, so I really appreciate that. I'm sure the town does as well. Um, the other thing to remember is that because there is a microphone here, we're going to ask that folks, when you're answering or when you're asking questions, that you come up to the microphone, <coughs> not this one, that one. Um, on the table in front of us and ask your question there. Make sure that you say, and this is for the folks on Zoom too, make sure that you say your name and your um, address if you are a property owner in Cohasset. Uh, and if you are not, make sure that you let us know what your affiliation is um, if you're joining for another reason. Um, and then the last thing I'll just mention is that if you have some thoughts but you don't necessarily want to share it, in front of everybody, you are welcome to submit something through the zoning comment form. So you can do that on those laptops over there. Uh, and then on the tables up here are some QR codes that you can scan to do that on your phone. Um, the new thing that I will just introduce is just to help us have this conversation. Um, I want to leave you with a couple of prompts uh, to think about as you're thinking about leaving comments. So the first one is, what do you like about the village? district as it is now, um, what do you want to keep about it? The second one is, what are your concerns about the village district that you see now? And then the third one is, uh, what would you like to change? So if you're thinking about what you want to say, you aren't sure, keep those questions in mind, uh, and then we can get started. So anyone on Zoom? Yes, uh, Elizabeth Dunn. Great. Who's, who is not Elizabeth? <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize. It's another bait and switch. It's uh, Mark Dunn. Um, you know, hey, thank you again so for your uh, thank you again for your efforts here. Um, you know, um, Mark, what is your address? Oh, uh, twenty one Beach Street. Great. I thank you. Um, and you know, Tom, I know you can't uh, discuss the uh, merits, but. Could you mention just what the application before the planning board is uh, as it affects uh, the village? I'll mess with uh, the, the, the project that it is at the site of the gas station and consistent with what the zoning in the village is designed to do. It is for a mixed use building, commercial on the first floor, residential on two floors above. <coughs> 
there is on-site parking for the residents. Um, and uh, what's unique about the site, one of its design challenges is that James Burke goes under the village in a culvert, and they had to account for allowing access to James Burke next to their site in case it ever had to be dug, dug up and get access to the culvert. So that was one of the design challenges of that site. But that's what's proposed right now. OK, thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the front and Great. Jonathan Bailey Francois, resident of 22 Redgate Lane. Uh, is the height limit of the highest point for FAR uh, the highest of occupied space? And uh, or is the additional height to the dedicated for mechanical equipment? Uh, or I'm going to repeat that. That didn't come out oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then if it's, uh, and does the FAR include the uh, highest point of mechanical to the occupied space for mechanical or to the highest point for occupied space? And then what is that highest point? Okay. Good, good question. So stand up as well. All right, so two slightly different concepts. So FAR is floor area ratio and is the measurement of the interior space. And it's and the concept is allowing communities to, to uh, regulate the three-dimensional space rather than traditional zoning talks about you know, length and width and two-dimensional. Um, the state, state laws and state attorney generals are approving bylaws to use FAR and to use three-dimensional zoning. And that's something we are looking at. Not only did we first bring it in with the village and then brought it to the harbor with the overlay district, but we're looking at that as a possible concept all over town, even in the residential districts, uh, as, as a means of measurement. But it, it's not including height per se, it's, it's the interior space, and without having the bylaw definition, it includes most of the livable space, but I think that there is some excludable space in it, uh, probably the empty space in an attic that couldn't be used as a, as a residence because of the uh, height limit, it would be included in that. Now the height is completely different concept. It's just strictly a measurement from top, bottom to top in, in terms of our bylaw definition. And as I mentioned earlier tonight, the, the definition of height is something we've been looking at for quite some time about changing because it, it can be confusing uh, where you start at the bottom since most places in town do not have a level piece of land, we have undulating properties. And so um, the current bylaw requires just a couple of bottom measurement points. As a matter of policy, we're trying to implement more and the new definition would require more around the perimeter. So you account for all of that. And then the height is just the, the raw height of the building itself on the outside. And one of the parts of our bylaw right now is that on a slope roof, a pitched roof, the measurement goes to the middle of the pitch, not the top. That's an illogical change in some of our views and something we're looking at possibly changing. A flat roof, it'll be to the flat. To the uh, pitched roof, it can allow for another five feet to the point of that pitch, and that would be 40. And the mechanical equipment, correct me if I'm wrong, Woody, that's an extra two. So on the 35 feet, you're allowed up to another five, is it, for mechanical? No more than 5%. 5% of the, of the height of whatever that given building is. And, you know, the, some of the village projects we've looked at, we like to see screening for that as well. If somebody's going to put something up there. So at the moment, uh, we're not looking at changing the FAR. The bylaw has a built in where you can increase the FAR, you can increase your density, but you, there are certain public benefits you have to trade back in order to get that. The, the, the baseline, but the baseline FAR and the bonus <coughs> FAR is not something we are looking at changing because given the compact size of the village, it works for the sizes that we put in. Great. Um, any Zoom questions? Yes. Great, and broken. Awesome, and all you. 
Hi, Ann Brophy, 16 Beachwood Street. Um, sorry, but I have really uh, grave concerns about hearing about that height for the village area. So what I'm visualizing, as nice as the red lion is, but I want you to take the red lion, the size, because you said the red lion is a, is approximately the, the size of the, the height limit that you're talking about. Maybe it's a little bit less than what it could actually have been. And you take that building and you put it where dependable cleaners is, where that blooming place, uh, 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 blooming, you know, Darylins, uh, all of that, all of that whole corridor. And if you, if it's all maximized with that height, uh, it, we're going from a quaint little village to towering developments. And I really have concerns about that. You know, I know that everyone has been talking about the village. But it's not so much, they're talking about how tired looking it is, not that we want to make it into a building like the one at the stop and shop. Uh, you know, I really have concerns about the height. And I'm wondering, you, you've said that it's been working, so you're not contemplating changing it. But, but really, there has not been any major development down there. I mean, other than the apartments, but those aren't in the village, really. That's, I think of that as out, it's not in the view but there has not been really any development right in that village. And I, I'm, I'm really worried about the 35. I, I think it's too high. But anyway, that's that. Thank you. Sorry. Right. Yes. Thanks, Anne. And, and you bring, bring up a good point. But like I said at the beginning, the 35 foot height limit is all over town in our residential districts, as well as our commercial districts. I can tell you from some of our large form review projects on the planning board there's people who are concerned about 35 feet in residential districts as well um, but it's it's in the range of what you normally find in a suburban community uh, 30 to 35 feet is typical or common we're on the high end yes but um you know part of the effort i want to say is that we haven't been looking to make major radical changes. There may be some significant changes that come, but we, we're not looking to just make radical change for the sake of radical change. And until this forum, and this is the kind of feedback we're looking for, we haven't heard any concern about the height number. The height definition, yes, because that could theoretically lead to a 40-foot high building. But the height number, we haven't heard a lot of feedback on it. And yes, the village is currently zoned, could have buildings at 35 feet. I don't know exactly what the height of the red line is, but I'm just going to guess it's pretty close to the limit. Uh, the limit is being, is being proposed at another building and, and it's being proposed now. And yes, that could happen. And, you know, this gets into the philosophy about the village being a small, quaint village, but whether it survives as not as an economically viable uh, center of the community. And, you know, th th this is just me personally talking. I look at Situate Harbor and I remember when Front Street had a lot of vacancies running down. What, what has saved Front Street, in my opinion, is hospitality uses and the fact that they brought people living down there. But yes, the condos are very high down there. The setup of their village down there is a little different than ours. And I get it. And, our village is a lot more compact and, and, and would have a different effect if we had all buildings at the size. But this is the kind of feedback we're looking for because nobody has really said 35 feet is a problem. Although we do, as I said, we hear it in various contexts, including with residential homes as well. So uh, it's certainly something we're gonna make a note of and, and take a look at. Anyone in the audience with a, yes, you. Hi, Don Canetta, 173 A Hull Street. Um, I'm trying to decide how to phrase this, but with all due respect to private property owners, is there a way that the zoning board, either through bylaws or regulation, can pass something to address the aesthetics and cosmetics of some of the buildings in the village? Right. 
40. You're going to help me on this one. But... I, got a, I got a big no. Where, 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 <laughs> where, where I first learned this was at a Mass Association of Conservation Committee meeting 30 years ago. They hold, they hold it every year at Holy Cross. And the wetlands bylaw has some aesthetic components in it, or the wetlands state law as well. And that's where they said to us, absolutely never, ever, ever make a decision based on aesthetics alone. It won't hold up in court. That I can tell you as a lawyer, that they won't hold up. So we have these guidelines to at least push people in a direction. Should we make them regulations to maybe make them a little more of a push? Personally, yes, but that's up to the community to give us some feedback on. But we're not going to put it in a bylaw. And there's nothing we can do to mandate how people maintain their existing properties. And we all, I, I read all the same comments on 143, and that's a big complaint. But we can't do anything about that. Except, again, the concept in 2007 was to make these properties economically more viable by providing the opportunity for rental resident, residences in them so that the property owner could make more money and perhaps take pride in, in, in their property and, and uh, make it look better. But that's about all we can do is give some incentives around the margins rather than being able to dictate anything. Yeah, what do you think? Hi, Woody Chet, 98 South Main. There is one thing that we cannot do presently, and we can't do it via the bylaws, zoning bylaws, but that's called a historic district commission. We have a very small one around the common, but uh, a town like Hingham has 11 historic districts, and, and their commission uh, has uh, much more authority, actually, than a zoning uh, board has. They can, in fact, opine on uh, design elements so on and so forth. And I'll just say parenthetically, um, I've talked to the people in Hingham and in other towns about historic district commissions. They tend to inflate or increase property values greater than the average in a town because people know that they will be protected and historic uh, structures will be maintained and not raised. And we see that raising going on all over town. So it's something perhaps down the road I'd like the town to think about historic district commissions that is, have a much broader um, uh, sweep than uh, simply the houses around the common. I frankly think we'd all benefit uh, from that, but we don't have one, really, in effect. That's, that's a good point. And you know, I, I recall the decision the planning board made last year about one Pleasant Street, the one along the tracks. We did get an opinion from the historic commission on that one, and I think that's because in the bylaw we built in historic commission comments certain year uh, if, if the building is x number of years old and their finding was in that building that it had no um, historic. major historical significance and as a matter of fact the new building doesn't look too much different it's pretty much the same footprint as the existing building or was the existing building but it's not the village is not a historic district which as what he said gives a historic commission even more teeth than just being offering an opinion now have they told us uh, you know, this is a historic significant building, then yes, the planning board, we may have looked at that a different way and been, been able to push the permit that we issued into a different direction. The other thing we are talking about is what's called demolition delay. And we've bandied this about in this town since the mid 2000s and never even brought it to town meeting, much less passed it. Other towns have that, and, but all of that does is what the word implies is delay. It can delay a demolition of a historically significant structure, and there's a set definition for that, and try to explore, in, typically the time period is six months, and in those six months, try to explore alternatives to tearing the building down. And I, I recall a famous case in Hingham many, many years ago, and I think the result of it was they saved the historic facade, but then they built a modern office building behind it. I think it's a bank today down in South Hingham. But those are things we're talking about. But again, there's kind of limits as to what we can do on a private property owner to do what they want to do. Do you have anyone on Zoom with their hand raised? We do. Great. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Dunn again. Or awesome. Or <laughs> Mr. Dunn. The artist formerly known as Elizabeth Dunn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mark Dunn, 21 Beach. 
Um, Woody, I think that's a great suggestion because when you go through, uh, you know, Duxbury or Hingham, you can really see that that has some teeth um, and you can't legislate taste, uh, but you can legislate uh, historic um, uh, construction and uh, design. I think that'd be a really good idea for the village. The other point I would raise um, in relation to at least one of the properties there that seems um, in, in great uh, disrepair, which is where Dependable Cleaners is, is whether there are public safety um, issues, uh, you know, associated with maintenance of properties. Uh, you know, I noticed there's a, a wire hanging off uh, that property. Uh, some of the um, uh, siding has come loose, but I'm just wondering if there are some ways to kind of enforce uh, maintenance, because I think uh, that would be something that would uh, uh, be helpful. And then I just have two other unrelated comments. Uh, one is, is it possible to put somewhere in the future an idea of sinking the uh, power lines um, in downtown? And then more realistic and maybe more important, is there a way to get a some kind of pedestrian access to the train station uh, from, from the village? And that with that, I'll uh, stop and thank you. Many, many parts to that, Mark. Um, <laughs> Uh, as far as a building that is falling apart, again, the zoning bylaw cannot mandate repairs uh, and, and, and can't dictate taste and maintenance to a property owner. But there can come a point where a building is unsafe. Um, a health department or a building inspector can come in and order things. But the, the, the building has to get to the point where it's a public safety hazard. You know, it's in danger of immediate collapse or something like that. It has to be quite an extreme. And I'm not aware of anything we can do about uh, the particulars of, you know, maybe a piece of siding falling off or something like that. Um, the other part, what was the second part again, Mark? I apologize. The power lines. Sinking. Oh, sink, oh, the sinking of power lines. Okay, so this brings me back to when I was on a select board many moons ago that when we were talking about improvements to the village of the sidewalks that many people might remember when we were getting money from the T for mitigation, a uh, project that never happened, but there's still remnants of proposed sidewalk designs you can find in the village and uh, the little town walkway. And we had the utilities come in and, you know, like common sense said, well, storms and stuff, wouldn't it be easier for you to put the, put the uh, utilities underground and it's their, their utilities, so they control them. And again, I'm not sure we can compel them to do anything, but their answer, and this is going back 20 years, but their answer was an emphatic no. They didn't want to do it. Uh, they did point out that they go underground. They still have to access them for repairs from time to time, and they would need to tear up a sidewalk or create an access panel or whatever. But there was an emphatic no from uh, the utilities at the time in doing that, and we would need their cooperation to do that. Um, as I recall at the time, we discussed, though, that if we were going to be tearing up sidewalks, it would be maybe smart to put utility sleeves underneath them so that in the future, if the utilities agree to put them underground, we could do so. Uh, we would have the infrastructure for them already under the ground. Uh, on the town sidewalks, that's a town project. And whether we get a particular developer to do that, that gets back to the question we talked about earlier about linkage and impact fees. And, and again, there needs to be a relation to the particular project. Uh, sidewalk, you know, an access from the village all the way to the T station. Yes, that's public sidewalks. That's a town obligation we would have to take on. It's not something that Sony would necessarily address. Yes. <laughs> Teddy Mara, 75 Pleasant Street. I wanted to know if you could speak to the average height of the buildings in the village now. Which one? The average height of the village buildings. <clears throat> like, is there an average? I'm Just because, me, like, looking at the buildings, I'm, you know, I don't know what the heights are. I, I 
no, I, you know, we'd have to have, somebody would have to sit there and tally up all the buildings and what they are. But typically, sure. thirty-five feet is going to be two and a half to three stories. The reason so I two, so yes. two story the two story buildings in the village are certainly well up under thirty-five feet. <clears throat> Perhaps if they have a peak roof, they might get close to one story, which is the gas station. I think is the only one story. Maybe a couple of others. But they're they're not going to be anywhere close to thirty-five feet. So you're looking at two and a half to three stories. Again, depending if there's a flat roof, peak roof. I don't know, Wayne, if you have a feel in the village for you know, your property down there. How, how, your building is an example. How tall do you think that is? I don't mean to put you on the spot. That's okay. You know no, because it, a lot of what's being said is, is really true and practical. I mean, I have a building Can you just and I tell think. Us your name and address. Okay. Wayne saw it, Chuck, 432 Beachwood Street, but I'm the owner of 30. Five to 39 and 45 rear of South Main Street. So the B a Bistro building is, is mine. And some of what, by having it set back from the, the street, my building doesn't look like it's that tall, but it really is about 30, 32 feet tall. And it allows for the, the two floors of residential. So, and that's almost a requirement to be able to make any new project to go through is you you can't build a one-story building or a two-story building. It really has to be, if you want, if the first floor is going to be a business, and generally that has a higher roof than a, than a house, so usually that's 10 or 12 feet high because you've got space like this. If this was a, you know, if we put, uh, you know, so the height of the first floor is going to then dictate the height of the second two floors. And there are some criteria that I was really surprised at myself in terms of measurement, like on the, the slope part of it, it, it goes to the middle of the thing. If it's a flat roof, you can go to the, you know, you can go up the thing. So I would say today that the, the average height of the, the three-story buildings and the, the, uh, the red building across from the red line is three stories, um, is probably right at 30 feet, 32 feet now. Uh, the red line in may off the street be higher because it's it's up about four feet to start with because of the pavement and the little ramp that goes up. So that's that's probably right at very close to 35 feet. Does that help it? For yeah. No, thank you, Wayne. That's very helpful. And again, Wayne makes a very good point, too, as we think about development in the village, that modern economics with real estate is such that everybody is going to come in with a three-story building with two stories of residences. It's, it's, the numbers just probably wouldn't work otherwise versus some of these folks. So, so you know, that, that's a reality that we have to face. If we put the height down to a limit uh, that makes that unfeasible, then we won't see the kind of redevelopment and revitalization of the village that was originally our target to try to encourage. Thank you. Did you have Thanks. A, you yes, had a I just, I yes. Uh, actually, that's a really good point in terms of a setback and the fact that there's a patio. <clears throat> so there's a distance from the street. So you spoke about having a buffer zone around, you know, between commercial and residential buildings in the village. Just a, an idea to have a buffer zone from the street and increase possibly the setback for these 35 foot buildings. Um, just an idea. And another thought that I had was that part of the character for me in the village is the presence of trees and the variety of trees and the sizes of trees. There are a lot of mature trees in town, especially the common, but also in the village district. Um, and so I wanted to know with the any new applications, any shadow studies, if they consider the livelihood of trees and green space in the village. Thank you. Um, the, the, the idea of having, you know, again, you want to make the village, whatever it becomes in the future, a vital space and encourage people to use it, sit, and enjoy it. And the idea of having a larger setback in the front is, is an appealing one. Also remember though that these lots are also very small, so then you know, can they squeeze in a building that will that will work? But that's that's a great idea, and, and and we're getting those kinds of designs from what we're seeing re recently. Um, the the property owners, uh, the, the design guidelines might 
dictate trees or suggest trees. Um, we are seeing I, plantings from all the, the recent applications that we are getting down there, and people are conscious of that. Um, shadow studies have been brought up. I, I'm not sure if we've re Pleasant Street, we didn't require one, but I think it's been brought up more recently. Um, but we, we do look at that. And then, you know, the, the trees that are right along the street are the town's responsibility. But again, this is where we get into what can we get the developer to do offsite, make improvements to the sidewalk, protect the tree. We certainly can order them to protect the tree during construction. But can we get them to do something else? Or if a tree is dying, get them to replace it? That's a, since it's off site, we have to, it's a matter of negotiation. But you know, so far we're getting the cooperation of property owners to do that because they have an interest in their property looking good as, as much as the whole town does. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anyone have additional questions from the audience? And remember, yes. <laughs> Uh, my name is Chartis Tebbets. I live at 9 Jerusalem Road Drive. I was wondering about the uh, gas station that's closed. Has it been, the, uh, the whole property been examined for a p possible uh, contamination of the soil and especially where Bound Brook is running nearby? I think it should be cleaned up even if it's not dangerous, but I just wondered what the status of that is. Uh, and that, that's part of the pending project, but um, there are state law requirements for them to do what's called a 21E. That's the yeah. name of the step, the developer. It's all on the developer, the property owner. So the person who buys the property? Correct. The person Correct. Property. Yeah. Buy. And if you go around the corner on Depot Court and where, well, now it's the Blue Ore Pizza Place, then there's that new building as the Yoga studio used to be had the pink tulip in it. That used to be way, way back in time, even before my time here, a gas station. And it had an issue. And so when that property has changed hands, and I have some personal knowledge about one, at least one change, there have been examinations that needed to be done. And anyone who is borrowing money on a property that used to be a gas station or a dry cleaner, that's another big toxic use, they are going to need to do what's called a 21E investigation. 21E is the Massachusetts hazardous waste statute. Um, so I, I'm aware that the developer of that project has done it. They would have to do it. And then they have to do whatever remediation is called for. Reports get filed when they do these investigations by what's called a licensed site professional, so somebody who's an expert in this gets submitted with the state, and then there's different levels of reaction that the state can order. If the state thinks it's dirty and it needs to be, then they go to a, another level, and they do have to excavate the whole thing and scoop it out. It's happening down on um, South Main Street near the old gas station that's across from the Catholic Church, the building that burned down. There's been an investigation there, too, because there is the both for the neighboring property and the former use of that property before it burned down, there was the potential hazardous waste use. So all those things get examined. Uh, but it's done at the state, it's done by the applicant, and it's done in, under the direction of a state law that DEP manages. And obviously, when we're doing our permits, it can be a condition of our permit that these things be done, that they follow the state law, this whatever the state agents or DEP directs them to do, and they have to do it. And they're not going to. They're not going to be able to borrow a dime unless they do these things, because no bank is going to lend on a property like that without it. So there's all incentives in the world for these things to be done, but it's outside the strict control of zoning. Other than that, our zoning talks about, uh, like for a site plan review, uh, that there can be no, you know, no risk of, of uh, release of hazardous waste or hazardous materials. So we do have some things where we can condition these things to be done. But really, the control for it is outside the, the town boards. But you can go ahead. In this uh, segment of the uh, meeting tonight, though, I thought we were <clears throat> sort of looking ahead and trying to figure out a plan. And I don't know how you could plan for the village to change 
without, first of all, having that issue dealt with as to whether this very large piece of property in an important part of the town is, is, is ever going to change if nobody's willing to clean it up or, 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 I mean, I don't think you can be unwilling to clean it up if you know that it's contaminated. But it seems that a plan for the village would have to zero in on this potentially delaying situation that other people might not be as interested in fixing up what's across the street if they have not yet uh, examined both the surface and the underneath the surface of, of that entire piece of property, because that was a big garage. You know, they did a lot of work on cars there, plus they sold gas. Yes, but there, there, are, there are inspections that get, I mean, I'm no expert on 21A, uh, you know, enough to be dangerous, but I'm no expert on it. But the, there are inspections that people who are in that business have to do from time to time. So they discover whether they have a leaking tank or not, and they have to do it. And if a, a developer comes along and is scared away from the site because it's dirty and they don't want to pay the cost to, to uh, clean it up, I mean, they have to discover that. So there'll be a report that gets filed with the state that discovers it. They can choose to back out of their deal and not do it. But then it's going to be left on the gas station owner who's left behind to clean it up. And the state can order them to do that. So I think these things are always taken care, care of. And in the history of the village, uh, knowing the site around on Depot Court, I think where the potential plumes of oil and gas are, are known. And the same down on South Main Street across from the church. It's known what has migrated from the site, if anything. Uh, because of prior studies and because of ongoing reporting application, reporting requirements of your in that business, type of business. So I, I think the safeguards are there. But again, for the town to take that on, that, that, that's a big expense for the town to hire engineers. We'd have to have the cooperation. We just can't march on private property and say, we're going to inspect you for 21 So. All right, any folks from the audience? We have, it's only 8.50, so we've got a fair amount of time left. And, and I just want to remind folks about the prompt that I left you with when we started, which was, what do you like about the village district? What are you concerned about? What would you like to change? So anyone has any insight they'd like to provide? Yeah, please. I'm the youngest one here too, so I'll speak up a few times. Uh, Jonathan, Billy Francois, 22 Red Gate Lane. Something I really love about the town village is that space right next to French Memories, which is kind of like a park, but I was just made aware that it's private property that was a location of a burnt down building. Mm -hmm. And how can we confirm, or is there a way to make it so that we don't lose that park like space in the center of our village uh, to another building that's going, going to go up? <laughs> that, that, that discussion came up many times in the harbor as well. Uh, turn it into a park. Uh, the answer to that is the town would have to buy it and pony up the money for it. Um, we, we, we just can't, you know, we could rezone that little parcel as open space. That would be shot down as spot zone. Um, you know, we couldn't we couldn't single out that lot for anything different than the rest of the village district in zoning. So the town would have to pony up and buy it. And that's as real estate prices are the way they are around here. It is becoming increasingly difficult. And we are blessed with a lot of the town is open space. A lot of people don't know how much on the west side of town over towards Wampatuck. It's a large percentage of our town is open space, but. You know, in the areas where it's developed, all that land is pricey and we'd have to pay for it. Uh, so that's that's the solution. You know, be my guest to start a campaign for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyone on? I see your hand. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi. I'm Nancy Rose. Seven Highland Ave. When and if. Um, buildings downtown are taken down and rebuilt, 
Does there have to be parking for all the apartments up above or are those buildings grandfathered or is that space grandfathered because there is an apartment there now? What about parking for all those apartments up above? Okay, so, um, Clark, do you have the bylaw handy? I don't know if you want to take a quick look under Article 18, but- um, Yeah, I think if you're within 500 feet of the yeah. village parking lot, we, we, we have it so required, but every developer wants to have on-site parking because it's a benefit to their um, correct yeah. to their future owners. So seller so, like to have a dedicated parking spot. Generally speaking, in all the commercial areas, and this goes for the harbor as well as the village, you cannot use on-street spaces to, towards your count of what you're required to have. Um, you know, a mixed-use building in the village, what our bylaw will say, you need X number of spaces for the commercial use, you need X number of spaces for the residential use. The village is unique in that the bylaw allows the town parking lot to be used towards your required count. If you were within 500, is it feet or yards? Feet, I think it's feet. So that's a little different in the village is that we're letting development there use the parking lot for their count. Now, in the recent projects on Pleasant Street, they've got 20, no, 30, it's all close to 30 spaces on site. Um, the, the thing at the ice cream parlor, if it ever does get built, that's got on site. The project before us has on site for its residential use. Um, again, I think Clark is correct that there's a giant incentive for people to do that to attract residents who aren't going to have to walk many, many feet from the town parking lot in the dark at night back to their apartment. But the village does allow the lot to be used towards its count. Now that gets us into parking again, where, you know, there's a zoning thing that maybe we change, maybe we don't. But we all know that in the village on a nice Saturday night in the summer, it's busy because we have some thriving hospitality uses. We have another one that was permitted that didn't get up and running this summer, but it'll be up and running next summer. The Red Lion has a function. It, there's a lot of demands on the lot. And then we have employees. And one of the other things about our bylaw that's come up in some of the discussions down in the recent proposals in the harbor is that we do not dictate that employee parking has to be somewhere. And that's something we may address in the Bible. But, you know, the town as a whole is eventually going to have to face what do we do about parking and where can we put it? And we only have so much space. We have a little town lot, 17 spaces next to the Veterans Memorial in the harbor. We have another town lot up behind the light keepers. And if there's a function going on up there, no spaces. Um, in the village, we have the main lot is a little satellite lot up uh, just a short distance on the other side of the tracks up Pleasant Street. We are going to have to face that issue at some point um, because it is going to become an increasing problem. Of we're, you know, we're encouraging this development and there's tax benefits to encouraging some of this development, but we have to have, as long as we're dependent on the automobile, we have to have places for people to go. You know, and, and I will say that one of the, the more recent projects we did in the harbor the developers come up with an innovative solution, making a deal with somebody else who has a lot that's usually not full and most of the times, and there's gonna be shuttling of their employees and their overflow traffic. And so that's a creative solution to that one particular development. That solves their problem. It's not necessarily gonna solve anybody else's problem, but you know, it's, it's something we are going to have to face going down the road. You want to more questions from the audience. Anyone have? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're Plus speaking that. for a whole generation. Yeah. No <laughs> I suppose so. Uh, Jonathan Billy Francois, 22 Redgate Lane. Uh, I know with a lot of new construction, we have to identify uh, what vehicle uh, transit is going to look like in the future. So what does our zoning look like for providing electric uh, vehicle charging for new construction projects as well as bicycle uh, parking? I know that there's a lot of just sprawling bicycles on the sidewalks, but not really spaces for the bicycles. Uh, so both electric vehicles and uh, bike parking, uh, new construction projects I'd like to know more about. 
My answer to that is I don't exactly know. So the, the, the whole thing about sustainability, climate change, green development, Clark is going to speak to that at our December uh, forum when we talk about environmental issues. But all of this is a lot of new territory for everybody. There are now model, model bylaws that have been developed on climate change and resiliency, on green development, on low impact development. And there's no reason where we require X number of parking spaces that we could also say a particular use needs X number of bicycle spaces, X number of charging stations. I, I, I can't see that we wouldn't be able to do it, but it's all new territory that, you know, who has actually done that yet. And, and our guide to that are either these model, model bylaws or perhaps like Boston, you know, the cities are probably ahead of us in the suburbs on developing that kind of thing. And there's certainly things we can look at. I don't know, Clark, if you want to speak to it, but it'll be the subject of two seminars from now. As well. Yeah, well, um, about uh, 12 years ago when I was first on the, on the planning board, we got a grant to put um, bike racks all over town. Town would, town would buy them and then get reimbursed. And I thought it was going to be a big PR thing that where all the planning board members could install these bike racks together. It ended up me on a Saturday night digging up the, the village, uh, the bricks and bolting in concrete. Anyway, um, we got reimbursed. Um, it, it was a grant that, you know, was was good to do, I think. Um, but since uh, lots of people have delighted in telling me how um, they leaned their bike against the bike rack that I put in. Um, it seems like nobody locks their bikes in Cohasset for some reason. Um, but also one of the, one of the big um, uh, master plan recommendations in terms of sustainability is to get electric um, charging stations in as many municipal buildings as well as um, commercial projects. So that's, that's sort of a part of one of, the driving, um, one of the driving goals of the master plan, the future yeah. transportation. <laughs> Yes. Well, is there anyone on? Yeah, one person. We're going to go to the Zoom person first, and then I'll come to you. <laughs> and Brophy. It's all you, Ben. Hi. Hi. Ann, Ann Brophy, 16 Beachwood. So I just want to say one thing, listening about all the parking, and 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 I, I take your point, um, uh, Tom, about how the change for the Situate Harbor uh, has revitalized Situate Harbor, but Situate Harbor is completely different than Cohasset. And I want everyone to think about the village. When, when, when people think about Cohasset, the village of Cohasset, what comes to mind? What comes to mind is the common, okay? And the common is the historic district. I love that idea that was presented earlier about expanding uh, the historic districts in the town of Cohasset. I fear that uh, with all this talk of the structures being able to be, well, as you said earlier, not only 35, but they can actually go even higher than that. And then where's all the parking going to go? I mean, think of it now when it gets busy with the cars at the angle and the pedestrians crossing the street, and you're gonna remake the, that area even denser by uh, maximizing the uh, viability, the economic viability of the village, you're gonna completely lose the village flavor. And I really would encourage some thought about uh, making that village area, expanding it into the historic district. Think about some of those developments that have been put up in Situate. They're making little mini cities in Situate. We're not Situate. And I love Situate, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that I think that we really need to think hard about about the direction that the town wants to take as far as this little village goes. We, we don't, I, speaking for myself anyway, I would love to have it remain the, the uh, quaint little village flair and maybe just not so tired. Just pick up the buildings a little bit and think about making it a historic district and minimizing the heights. That's just a, it's way too much. But anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> I, I... I would just say about that, you know, this gets into the philosophy of where we're going, not just the mechanics of what bylaws we change. But, you know, the town of Cohasset has seen fit not to make any changes in, with respect to height and the, since 1955 when the bylaw came into effect. Um, these issues didn't come up in 2007 when we were discussing the changes to the village that 
led to the bylaw we have today. Um, you know, my own personal view as an attorney who deals in this area is that, you know, Massachusetts zoning law is not about stopping development, it's about conditioning it. And, you know, to a certain extent, we have to accept the reality that time marches on, there is quote unquote progress, however you see progress. And, you know, there's only so much we can do about restricting develop, redevelopment and reuse of people's property. I mean, on, on the extreme, you get into the issue of regulatory takings, the regulatory equi equivalent of eminent domain. That's an extreme, because Massachusetts law is fairly liberal on the subject. But, you know, we, we have to be realistic about what we can do and what we can't do, and that everything we're telling you uh, could happen in the village, could happen tomorrow. The bylaws are written in the way they are now to allow all of this to happen. So this is the feedback we're looking for, but I want everybody to be realistic about what concrete change to stop a certain type of development that you think we can make. It's not going to be that easy. The law isn't designed that way. Yes. Wayne Sychuk, 432 Beechwood Street. I think, first of all, I think I have to congratulate the town on the fact that we have charging stations at the library on, on Ripley Road and, and at the, the old highway barn at the town, town parking lot and at the town hall, that we are promoting those things. And I think it's, it's, a, good, it's a good idea and it's great. In terms of uh, the development, I think that the town, uh, when I think when I look back and say, what did the town look like in 1965? It's almost the same thing as it looks today, only the, the paint was peeling and we didn't have people that were interested in getting together as a, as a, uh, uh, a business group that people like Bob Tesler at Cards and Shards got together. And all of a sudden we started painting all the buildings and, and cleaning up the downtown. And I think we made some great changes. I think the town, by the way, is really responsible for being able to use some of their land and create more parking. Because what happens is, I'm looking at something here that was from 2000 and I was gonna try to get here earlier and it's Enhanced Captain's Harbor Walk Project. It was all of the things to do around the harbor. And as I read them today, I said, these are the same issues that they have today. And, and you know, you, you create all these documents, all these, um, reports, the Benjamin report from 1960 that talks about what Cohasset would look like in the year 2000, and many of the things have come true, and a few of them haven't. The population has not grown like it was predicted. It was supposed to be about 60,000 people here in 2000, you know, so it, it you know, it, it was just a crazy number uh, because, the, because we didn't have a lot of strict zoning and things, but th there are projects in the town that have been designed. And I look and I went to the planning board and I talked to the planner and stuff and say, can we get some more parking on this Elm Street extension? And I hear nothing. I don't see anything. And yet I looked the other day and I found some engineered plans that were done 10 years ago for parking exactly where I think that they could put them. And it would create about 10 spots in an area that is already owned by the town that's not going to hurt anybody. We also spend money on designing, Cabanero Consulting has designed up to 90 spaces, except that there's a little bit of ledge on the end of the, the, the town parking lot. We have to look at some things. Otherwise, the businesses, if you, you've got a brand new uh, country store that's gonna open, that country store won't, won't survive if those spaces in front of their store are, are filled 24 hours a day. It just isn't going to happen. We have to have it so that the, the businesses have parking and the employees have parking elsewhere and, and take care of those things. So it's not zoning. It's more, it's more having the town as a whole, every, all the committees and stuff, getting together and making things happen. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely right. Anyone on Zoom? It's all you. Uh, Doug McGregor, 7 Border Street. Uh, 
I'm passionate about parking. You might have heard my name around about parking issues um, involved in the, some business in the village. And founding on what uh, Wayne said, I want to make an observation. The, the town lot is not a bottomless well of parking. And when I learned that developments aren't required to provide their own parking, and it's just, oh, don't worry, it's 500 feet from the lot. I think that's something that I'd encourage any board to get ahead of, to think about the future, that as we have more development in the village, that isn't required to provide their own parking. It's just not, like I said, a bottomless well of parking spaces. It is getting full. And there's a little, you know, some movement around the parking ad hoc committee to try to study this. But that's just my observation is that this just can't be this catch all answer that there's plenty of parking because it's near the town lot. It is full. It's often, there is not parking available. So that's my observation tonight. Uh, and, and that's a good uh, that's a good observation because I don't think in 2007 when we were redoing this village bylaw we really thought of it because the demands weren't there then that there are there now, and so I'm making a note to myself that even that 500 foot requirement might need to be rethought. Um, but again, so far, uh, you know, at least since I've been on the planning board the last couple of years, the two developments that we've seen are providing on-site parking. Um, and you know whether we should get back to a mandate to that as exists everywhere else in the town, by the way, maybe that's a direction we should go in. But again, it's more of a where to put it problem than a zoning problem. But... So we have about five minutes left. It's currently 9.10, 9.09. Um, so, now is your, if you've been sitting on a question, you weren't sure you wanted to ask it, now is your chance. This goes for Zoom folks too. If we, if there aren't any questions, I think maybe we can wrap up. So I will pass it to Tom or whichever one of you wants to lead us into the, into the end. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So again, if there's any new faces, my name is Lauren Lind. I'm the Planning and Zoning Director. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. For those of you who participated via Zoom and for anyone who's watching this after the fact, this will be available on the town website and our town YouTube channel, as well as I think restreamed on Class at 143 TV. So there will be ample opportunities to hear it if you haven't heard it already. Um, it's been great to see you all in person, actually, other than on a Brady Bunch screen. So thank you. And I just want to remind you all, this is the first of one of many conversations Conversations. We have two forums also scheduled right now for the rest of the calendar year, November 7th, the same room will be doing another forum about really focusing on housing policy and different topics related to housing and, and how you can zone for housing or how you can zone for different types of housing. And then in December, we'll be looking at climate and resiliency matters again, the same room, same sort of format and we just continue uh, to ask that you continue to participate. We also want to re-advertise the zoning comment form. If you have an opportunity, please uh, tonight or if you want to wait after your forums, this will be open for many months and we will be sifting through all of this feedback and the zoning bylaw committee will be continuing to look and hear your feedback and sort of think about new ideas as we as we think about zoning overhaul in the town. And then last but not least, I just want to make a shameless plug. The zoning bylaw committee has two vacancies. And so whoever, if you're interested and you feel really you know invested with tonight's conversation, we'd love to have you. You can um, apply to be on the zoning bylaw committee through uh, the town manager's office where like, like I said, looking for two more seats. And then finally, um, even if you want to attend and participate, but you don't want to be on the committee, all of the zoning ballot committee meetings are open to the public and accessible on the town meeting calendar. So please um, don't let this be the last we hear from you. We really appreciate your time. Thank you to all of our panelists, to our town manager who's here in the corner, Chris Senior. Thank you for joining us tonight. And um, thank you to the select board for your leadership. And there's many select board members who have been physically here and, and on Zoom tonight. So thank you for getting this group started and, and getting this project in motion. Thank you all and good night.